Mr. Cooper was appointed the Chief Information Officer here at Commerce and serves as the Principal Advisor to Commerce's 12 agencies, CIOs, and the Deputy Secretary. He also leads development and implementation of the Department's enterprise-wide information technology strategy and operations, oversees the building and operation of a robust enterprise IT security risk program, and serves as an advisor on mission and business IT systems and services. So welcome. Thank you all very much. You, you, you may want to hold your applause until the end to decide whether there's value added in this conversation. Um, and I am a big believer that in IT, information technology, although I would argue it's really information and technology. I'll explain the difference hopefully in my remarks. Um, we are a service organization. And everything that we do is really about enabling at the individual level, every one of us, every one of our colleagues around the department bureaus and our stakeholders inside and outside the Department of Commerce. Our role is to enable mission delivery and everything associated with mission enabling technology to accomplish that, people, process, technology, governance, and everything that encompasses. That is part and parcel of what I believe my responsibility includes as the CIO of the Department of Commerce. Now, having said that as an opening remark, let me pause and back up a little bit, put some things in context for you in my role. I've been on board about 18 months. In that time, we've accomplished an awful lot of things. I'll summarize a few things. And we have a significant number of remaining challenges based upon commitments that I made to Secretary Pritzker, Deputy Secretary Andrews, and the executive leadership of all the bureaus of the Department of Commerce when I went through both my interview process and then after I was selected to step into the role in kind of doing a listening tour in the first 90 days that I came on board to get a feel for the Department of Commerce. This is not the first federal CIO role that I have served in. It's also not the first CIO role at all in the sense that I've served as CIO in the private sector in the last 25 years of my career. And I've stepped into government, back into the private sector, three or four different times. This is my fourth, uh, whatever we want to call it, my fourth assignment in federal government and public service. And I thoroughly enjoy my time in public service. I consider it a privilege and an honor to be part of the federal government, the work that we do, and be part of the Department of Commerce. I take that responsibility very, very seriously in my role. That includes fiduciary responsibility to spend taxpayer dollars. That's a little bit, I don't know, I got about $1.98 in there. That's part of my responsibility as well, so that every dollar that we invest in IT is an optimal investment. Just to kind of get you started and give you a little bit of insight into some of my thinking, a little bit of my personality, I'm not convinced that every dollar that we're spending at the moment is being spent optimally. I'll expand on that in, in my remarks. Okay. When I came on board, Secretary Pritzker gave me three directives. I'm going to give them to you in the order of priority that she and I and Deputy Secretary Andrews agreed I would tackle these three commitments. So the first priority and the highest priority in her mind was, and I'm going to be very candid with you guys, I won't be profane, I'm not going to say anything unprofessional or or anything like that, not going to get myself or us into trouble in this conversation. But I'll be pretty candid with you. Um, we don't have any press present, right? No. All right, okay, so I'll be pretty candid with you. Um, the first thing she said was, Steve, fix the operational problems 
in your office and in this building now. This building meant the Hoover Building, HCHB here in headquarters, Commerce Headquarters. Our office, the office of the CIO of the department, serves a few of the smaller bureaus, and I mean that only in terms of size of population, um, headcount. Some of the smaller bureaus are served by delivery of services from the office of the CIO. And they are those bureaus that are mostly and primarily resident here in headquarters. Okay, what I learned in the process of coming on board and what I learned from that listening tour in the first 90 days of meeting with my customers was the following. First, these are not in any order. It's just as they pop into my head. First was, Steve, your office is not delivering operational excellence. Okay? We were delivering products and services, and those products and services broke or didn't work the way that they were supposed to work. Examples, unplanned network outages, downtime for email, no warning, no notice. So it disrupts and was disrupting the ability of people to be productive in using information technology, tools, products, solutions, applications, whatever it was, here in headquarters and then wherever we had customers beyond the building. The second, Steve, figure out a way to be more collaborative and effective in the delivery of information and technology. Listen to the important distinction, not IT the delivery of information and technology in concert with the Bureau CIOs. Okay, so what's, what's Penny actually telling me? What, what, was she, what was she communicating there? By the way, you didn't realize this was gonna be interactive, did you? <laughs> you thought you were gonna just show up and listen? Nah, sorry guys, mostly you will. Anybody wanna take a shot? What, what was she really communicating? Dion, what do you, what do you got there? Yes, I agree entirely. Why? What was she after? All right, I'm the point of content. That wouldn't change. Don't disagree. Don't disagree. All right. But what really was going on there was we've got an extraordinary amount of talent and capability in the bureaus in the Department of Commerce. And we have a federated governance model. What does that translate to? My words, every bureau is doing its own thing. Now, is there anything wrong with that? You guys tell me, anything wrong with that? Do the missions of the bureaus of the Department of Commerce, as best you each have visibility, do our missions overlap? The actual mission, patent and trademark, they do weather. You get my point. All right? I mean, that's a quick example. Picked out on purpose. All right? In reality, no. The missions really don't overlap. This is one of the first places in government where, where really and truthfully any of us can say the missions of the bureaus of the Department of Commerce do not overlap. The department, one way that I think about the department, the department is a holding company. We come together at the very top of the department and what do all the bureaus have in common? The role of the Department of Commerce, slightly oversimplified, is to foster the role of American business and technology around the globe and to publish a ton of data, more than any other federal department, including, I believe, DOD. But I can't get DOD's CIO to tell me truthfully how much crap you guys put out there. I really do think that we probably are the largest producer of data and information out to the public, our stakeholders, businesses around the globe, of any other federal entity. Think about that for a minute. That's a big deal. 
And I think most of us are fiercely proud of that capability. But what the secretary was communicating was, Steve, isn't there a way to tap into the talent, the skill, the expertise, the experience, creativity of all the folks in the bureaus, information and technology professionals, to more effectively leverage what some bureaus are doing and others may not be, so that that dollar of taxpayer money can be invested optimally to accomplish all of our mission goals and objectives in concert with our strategic plan, the department's strategic plan, data being a significant pillar of our five goals. Make sense? Okay, the third one, which is the one that, that just my personality and kind of what I enjoy was the one that was the most attractive to me in accepting the role. And that one very simply was, Steve, figure out a way to get us into the 21st century, okay? The example that she gave to kind of drive this home, when you walk into this headquarters building, right? By the way, whichever of the two entrances left that you can get into this building, okay? That's set on purpose, a little bit of teasing, a little bit of fun. But regardless of, of which entrance you come in, let me offer you the same challenge that the secretary asked me. When you walk into this building, what do you see that tells anybody we're in the 21st century? This is a beautiful building. Look at this library. It's been restored. It's beautiful. What century do you think this came out of? <laughs> I mean nothing negative by that, all right? But think about it. And when you exit, I want you to consciously look around. If you go from here out that door, it's easy. You're not going to see anything. But if you go through some other exit and exit the building, consciously pay attention. Do you see anything that leads you to believe that this department is in the 21st century? For example, if you go into many of the bureaus, and I won't single anybody out. Basically, you can pick any of them. You can certainly pick the large four or five. So that's NIST, NOAA, Census, PTO, and ITA in terms of po people, population. When you walk in, you see things like flat panel displays, information kiosks, turnstiles. You know, you badge in, you know, and it opens up, or mostly, in my case, never opens up. Um, I think they're trying to keep me out on purpose. They keep saying, no, Steve, you're badged. And Census, I'm picking on Census. Every time I get up there, I can't get in. And that's, oh, well, you haven't been here in a few days, so we cut it off. <laughs> yeah, okay, I think you never turned it on, but that's all right. That's, that's for fun. I'm not really kind of picking on them. Um, okay, but the reality is you don't see anything in this building, all right? If we are the department, whether it's Business USA or Select USA, tremendous accomplishments that are visible to stakeholders outside the building, we don't have anything when you visit the building. I love the, I love the elevators. I really do. I, I believe it or not, I'm being truthful, no jokes. The, the, you know, the brass needles that kind of rotate, I think it's pretty cool. And of course, you get in there, you can see the old, you know, the old days, the little flip down chair is gone, but you know the handle where there used to actually be an operator. Okay, all right, well that's great, but that's not really 21st century. How come we don't have video screens in the elevators that have current events? Certainly we could be playing podcasts of secretary, DepSec, major interaction of our bureaus with stakeholders and customers, information kiosks when you come into the lobby, the main lobby area. How about a people finder? Office locator, it's not very difficult to do. We don't have it, okay? So my point is, heroes do. We are at work, and my office along with facilities management, we are undertaking addressing that. 
That's a very simple example. Let's go to a couple nearer and dearer types of examples, I suspect, to many of you. How many of you, how, how many of you, well, this is a silly question, but I'll ask it this way on purpose, right? So how many of you carry a personal cellular device? Better yet would be, is there anybody who doesn't, who actually wants to admit it? Okay. Um, so playfully speaking, how many of you who have 10 apps or less on your phone, raise your hand. Okay, uh, all right, so for those of you out in, in uh, WebEx land, can I, can I say we had one hand go up, is that all right? Okay, we had one hand go up out of, I don't know, what do we got, 30, 40 people physically present. All right, so 25 or less, got a, a few hands, all right? Suppose I say more than 50, Okay, so I, I can't tell. In other words, you certainly have tens of apps. Do you use most of them? Not a trick question. In other words, I'm assuming you have them, you probably use them from time to time, right? Okay, so on your government furnished cellular device, how many apps you got? Okay, I don't see any hands going up. Um, should you have a few that actually help you be more productive, help you get done whatever it is you're trying to get done? Okay, you see my point? And again, this is not, this is not to criticize anybody. Okay, we are all on the same team. This is not about good guys, bad guys, we're doing something wrong. This is simply about recognition that we've been a little bit slow to move into technologies mobility, mobile devices that are in use, certainly in your personal lives, why don't we have them in the workplace? And in case you're running through your head, well, Steve, aren't there security challenges? We can and are able to address the security challenges, okay? Notwithstanding the current debate not asking for a show of hands about whether the government should be able to hack your iPhone. We'll let the FBI and Apple figure that one out. You can call your congressperson and weigh in if you want to. That's just an editorial comment as a quick aside. But since nobody chuckled, I'm assuming you all work for the government. Okay, so those were the three directives, three directives. Fix the operational problems. We have made significant success, and it's not me. It's the men and women in the office of the CIO, along with some of the other IT organizations in this building who have stepped up to assist us in correcting some of the problems, some of the challenges that existed. The good news, using some actual metrics and data, we have reduced the percentage of unplanned outages, downtime, loss of this, that, and the other thing, applications, email, in the 18 months that, that we kind of had this as a challenge and we took it on, by about 74 to 78%. It's visible, meaning it's tangible. We don't have any significant amount of unplanned outages anymore. That's good news. And it's absolutely a step in the right direction. We've got a little bit of cleanup work to do, got a few loose ends here and there. But for that one, I'm getting reasonably close to advising the secretary. I think we've got this one under control, and I think if you'll let me, we can, we can put a check mark next to this one. Certainly no later than the end of this fiscal year, if she wants a little bit more time to prove that we don't slide backwards all of a sudden. All right, the second one. The second one takes us into a couple big deal things that are going on that I hope all of you have some awareness of. How many of you know a little bit or a lot about the Department of Commerce Shared Services Initiative? Okay, looks like maybe about 50-50, all right? For those of you who may not be as knowledgeable, Probably a little bit before I actually came on board, 
So I don't know, I wasn't here for the initiation of this. But what now exists is a full-blown, well underway initiative to stand up a shared services organization. It reports to the deputy secretary. We have the executive director, Glenn Davidson, selected and on board. We have executives and staff who are beginning to populate the teams in that shared services organization. And that shared services organization is tasked with the emerging delivery of services that are designated by the Department Management Council. I'll come back to that if you're not familiar with that governance body. The DMC, Department Management Council, is the governing body for the shared service organization. They have already agreed to a set of services that will become shared services in human resources, finance, a little bit later out, information technology, and acquisition. And those services are going to be deployed beginning this fiscal year, and they will be phased over the next several years in waves. A wave is simply a period of time that combines the delivery of an agreed set of services to an agreed set of receiving bureaus. The first services out of the box are human resources. There actually is an RFP on the street, request for proposal, on the street, meaning out in industry. Teams have been formed, responses will come back to the department, and a team will be selected that team will then work under the guidance of this new shared services organization to deliver HR transactional services to the Wave 1 bureaus. And the largest Wave 1 bureau is NOAA. And then I don't, I don't have them all memorized. There are a couple other bureaus. Then Wave 2 will expand those HR transactional services to an additional set of bureaus. There may or may not be a wave three, I just can't remember off the top of my head. In a similar manner, beginning probably next quarter of this fiscal year, there will be a set of IT services that will go out to industry. Winning teams or bidders will be selected, again, to work with the shared services organization to deliver those services, and there are six initially, I'll tell you what they are in a second, to the Wave 1 bureaus, then followed by Wave 2, then followed by Wave 3, that kind of thing. Acquisition will move kind of about in parallel or maybe slightly behind, and then finance will, uh, will come a little bit later. And that's because the replacement or retirement and replacement of our current financial set of systems will not really occur until after the decennial 2020 census. We've missed the timeline or missed the timing to migrate to a new financial system. We can't, we can't take the risk now of trying to move the Census Bureau to a new system ahead of the decennial. Because if we screw it up, we, we run the risk of messing up a lot. And we don't want to do that. So the prudent thing is what we're doing. All right? We basically will sustain support to our legacy financial set of systems till after the decennial 2020, all right? Does that give you a feel for the shared services initiative? All right. The six services related to information technology. These are, in a sense, you can think of them as common services, meaning one size kind of will fit all, in mission enabling support not mission delivery. Examples. One of the services is video teleconferencing services. Okay? Pretty much everybody could use the same video teleconferencing system. We have either seven or nine. The CIOs aren't quite certain whether we have seven or nine. But we got a bunch of them. And why? When we asked any of the CIOs, hey, would your bureau like to kind of take over VTC and do it for the department, nobody raised their hand. Nobody raised their hand. 
Nobody wants to do that. Why not? What's going on there? This is a second little interactive quiz. What's going on? How come nobody wants to do that? I'm sorry? Resistance. Resistance to change, that's fair, although in this case, one, it's hard. <laughs> Which doesn't mean CIOs or IT gangs, you know, shies away from hard stuff. We do amazingly complex stuff, and we do it really well in the mission space. But how do you view video teleconferencing? Is it mission essential? What happens if it doesn't work? Do you have alternatives? Okay, phone, right, audio conference. Oh, here's, here's a novel one. How about getting up out of your office, walking next door and talking to the person in person? That's, that's said that way on purpose, just to poke fun. So you don't have to answer this. Anybody send an email to your colleague sitting right next door? Maybe text or chat or something like that. Okay, you get my point. In other words, VTC is not viewed as mission critical. More importantly, when it works and it is valuable, it's useful, particularly if you have a geographically dispersed team. It can indeed save money on travel. But if it's really only video teleconferencing and it's not linked to collaboration tools, it really isn't as valuable as, for example, a WebEx, where I can show everybody a presentation. Okay, you see my point? Not only that, but you have to go to, mostly in the department still, you have to go to a room that has the video teleconferencing equipment. Now, here's, here's the combination of a wave one shared service that we are going to do in a more effective and collaborative way, and maybe not quite move into the 21st century yet. How many of you use laptops, uh, fairly recent laptops, as your primary computing device? Okay, a, a fair number of you. All right, do you have a camera in your laptop? Okay. Well, you realize, of course, that we have the ability, we're not necessarily using it in every bureau today, to turn on that camera when you want it, and you can do basically desk-based or workstation-based or wherever you happen to be, you can link via video to anybody you want to who has a similar type of capability on the other end. Okay, Skype for business, if, if you guys are using that, used to be used to be Microsoft's link. Now it's called Skype for Business. Okay, how many of you use FaceTime on, on your iPhone? Same concept, right? That's the 21st century. And we're not quite there yet. All right, so very quickly, wireless networking, wired networking are two of the services that will roll out or that will be delivered as shared services phased over time. Um, managed print services, for those of you who may be in the uh, I, I, can, I don't even know where I am in this building. That way, <laughs> the Pennsylvania Avenue end of the building. If you're in the open office spaces, you're living with managed print services. Okay, the neat thing and what people are kind of catching on and then most of the feedback we get is very positive is what we call follow me printing. For those of you who may not have uh, managed print services yet, this basically means that you can basically off of your worktop I mean, your, your uh, workstation, device, laptop, whatever, you can simply queue something for printing. You can go to any print device, take your PIV card, just slap it up against the side of the, of the printer. There's a little reader. And it will pull up whatever you've queued up. You just punch either release all or select what you want, hit print, out it comes. And it will hold it until you get there and ask for it. A lot of people are catching on. Hey, this is pretty nice. And a lot of people have figured out, they'll, some people will queue stuff during the day, and on their way out of the building, they've got a route now. They go buy the printer that's you know, kind of on their route, print it, grab the stuff, take it home, do whatever they need to do if they need printed material. That's a quick example of part of what we can do with management services. But the other side of it is, every one of these, these printing devices, they're multifunctional devices, is linked and attached to the network. 
It's an intelligent device. So we know in advance when it's running low on toner. We actually also know when it's running out of paper. So we can be more proactive now in making sure that in the middle of the most critical presentation that you need to deliver to your executive management, the printer doesn't crap out on you. Or you run out of toner, or you run out of paper, something like that. Okay. So all of this is aimed at enhancing productivity. That's really what we're trying to do. All right? Identity credentialing and access management is the last of the six. And basically what we're talking about here is logical access. How many of you use your PIV card to log into the network when you, when you kind of turn on your workstation or your computing device in the morning? That's surprising. Okay, so those are, and this is curious, and I'm not trying to put anyone on the spot. Those of you who didn't raise your hands, um, are, you, are you, I assume you're in a commerce bureau somewhere. Is that mostly true or not? Yes. Okay, and your bureau doesn't require you to use your PIP card to log in? Okay, all right, so probably a few of the faces that now are speaking up are the Office of the Secretary. That's the uh, gang that my office supports. I know, why, I know why the answer is you're not using it. <laughs> we'll be fixing that this year. Most of our bureaus, yeah, it's, I mean, it's true. It's, it's here in headquarters where we're the worst in terms of percentage on logging in using your PIV card. But if you're in most of the other bureaus, you're using your PIV card to actually log into the network every day. That's exactly the way we want it to be. It's more secure. It's not perfect but it's more secure. That's where we're headed. It doesn't hurt that OMB is busy scoring us on this, and they're publishing the scorecard. And this is one area where, on public-facing scorecards, we're not quite where I'd like us to be, and I'm the accountable guy to OMB on any of these IT-related scorecards. We look pretty good on most of the stuff that OMB and The Hill and others are requiring us to do. This one, we're not quite where we want to be. But again, we've got teams working on this. I think we'll be in much, much better shape. The goal, by the way, set by OMB is 100%. Everyone, everyone in the department uses your PIV card to log into the network, logical access. The neat thing is that 21st century, we also can use that same type of approach so that you can be pre-authorized when you log in, it will give you access without additional passwords and things like that into the tools and the applications that you use every day or frequently to get your job done. That is where we're headed, guys. That sometimes referred to as single sign-on, but that capability will come a little bit, it'll take us a little longer to get there in all bureaus. Some bureaus are kind of already there in some cases with certain applications. But again, those are real examples of moving us into the 21st century. All right. How many of you are using open, well, let's see if I say open source. Um, how many are you using uh, at home different tools that you found on the internet that, that help you do things very, very easily and very conveniently? Anybody, anybody use uh, Doodle? Anybody know what that is? Okay, a few hands are going up. That's a, that's a really clever little tool that'll let you poll people and find common time to schedule meetings. And you just let everybody come and click on the times and it's very easy to figure out where's the common time. The app kind of does it for you, right? Um, many of you probably are using uh, you know, apps around financial type of stuff, financial management, personal you know, type things, things like that, scheduling. Uh, fitness apps, you know, all that kind of stuff. There's a huge amount of capability represented in free appware. Right? We've been slow to adopt some of those around productivity for use here in the department. It's a little bit more complex than just saying, oh, hey, Steve, why, why don't we just download it, let people download it and use it? Well, because the free versions, one, carry no support, two, aren't always quite as secure as you 
hope they are, if you've even thought about that. I have to think about that, and so does my team. So we have established a process, a technical review board, that's taking a look quickly. Quality with speed is the operative phrase. Quality with speed to ensure that those apps are available for use, they're properly licensed for the enterprise, meaning the department, and people who want to use them, and they're secure. And we've got an initial list of about 20 of them that we're working through fairly quickly, and we'll make those available basically to everybody as quickly as we can, quality with speed. That's another example. Now here's the interesting thing that we're also learning. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much uh, an old guy, <laughs> okay? Don't feel old, but the reality is, chronologically, I am. I'm not a millennial. I'm a baby boomer. And I've already retired a couple times, and I'm now kind of looking forward to spending a little bit more time with grandchildren, and things like that. So my view of the world and the use of productivity tools and everything, I actually do stay abreast of a lot of this stuff. But my expectation of whether these are mandatory in the work environment is based on 40 plus years of not having these things. So in my mind, eh, you know, if we have them, yeah, that's great. I'd like to get them out there as quick as I can. But my life doesn't end, so to speak, if they're not out there. Okay. But in conversations that I've now had with millennials, very, very different expectations. And some of them have been very direct in telling me, well, number one, you're an old fart, and you don't know what you're talking about. And two, I absolutely expect these things, and if they're not there, I'm not coming to work here. Think about that for a second. That's an incredibly important expectation that we have to meet. Have any of you seen the statistic on the percentage of federal government workers, not just IT, federal government workers under 30? Have any of you seen the, the most recent uh, data that's coming out of labor and OPM? Less than 5% of the workforce is under 30. You know what percentage of the workforce can retire today? 70%. I'm sorry, 70? The, the latest number, you might be right, the latest number that I've seen, which is probably now about a month old, was 58%. Think about that, 58% of us, meaning, and by the way, I'm not talking, you know, I'm not talking the early delayed thing where, yeah, you, you got enough years, but not age yet. I'm talking active retirement, meaning you can walk out the door, and seven years later when OPM finally processes your retirement claim, you'll get a check, okay? I mean, sorry, couldn't, couldn't resist. Uh, okay, so there's a very different expectation. That's part of the secretary's directive to me, Steve, get us into the 21st century. Now, here's one thing I'm pretty sure none of you thought of. Those in the room I can trap more easily than those on the WebEx, okay? I need your help. I need your help. If you guys get an opportunity, and if you want to, it's not mandatory. If there are things that you'd like to see that you don't have, will you tell me? If there are things that you'd like to see on your desktop, on your workstation, on your mobile device, in the way of apps, capability, whatever it is, would you please let me know? Okay, just send me, send me an email, send me a text, Probably easier as, uh, as email. I'll give you my cell phone real quick, and those of you who have good memories, because I just realized, wait a minute, do I really want to give everyone my cell phone? Yeah, I do, it's part of my job, all right? So my cell phone, if you want to send me a text, is 571-212-6379. I'm only gonna say it once. <laughs> but the email is pretty easy. It's scooper at doc.gov. Help us out. The more that you can guide us in the stuff that we're not doing or that you don't have available, the better off it is for everybody. Because we can help then 
prioritize, figure out how we deliver some of these things, and actually get them out there. That's part of achieving the Secretary's directive, get us into the 21st century. Now, there's other bigger complex stuff. How many of you, if, if any, in, in the room here, and those of you on the, uh, on the line, have to file a public disclosure, financial disclosure statement? Anybody? Okay, handful. All right. In the past, depending on the bureau you're in, but most of us, I believe, my understanding is, we filed on paper. Okay. How many of you love filing on paper? It's a kind of a pain in the tuchus, all right? No good. We finally have approved the use of a new application. It's hosted and it uh, it's, was prepared and done by the Office of Government Ethics. But we've adopted an electronic filing capability. It's called Integrity, and it now is available, all right? Well, that's another example. We have a new travel system that's coming online. We're working through it now with the finance gang. We're finishing some of the security aspects, risk assessment. That will be online this fiscal year. We are, in fact, making progress. In some cases, it's slower than I would prefer. It may be slower than all of you prefer. But the news that I'm trying to share with you is we really are making progress. And with a little bit of help from you guys to guide us on what we need to do next, we can prioritize those things. We can get those things out there faster. Okay? So does this give you a little bit of feel for kind of what we're up to and where we're going with information and technology in the Department of Commerce? Okay. Let me pause. How are we doing time-wise? A few minutes? We're, we're okay on time. You All have right. a, a growing number of questions. All right. What I was going to say was, let me stop uh, yapping here, and how about we take a few questions? Sure. Want to, want to start here? You want to start online? Um, why There's don't we do a few online? We've got right, over please. 200 people on the WebEx, right. and we'll do as many as we can, can fit in and have time okay. for. Okay. All right. Um, and I will just add, more than one person has asked for live video streaming, which we've been working with IT to try okay. and get. All right. So. We're, Live video we're... streaming, interestingly enough, technically is not really overly complex. The challenge is bandwidth. Yeah. So what we have to do, it does take money. It's really kind of simple. It takes money invested in expanding the pipes, bigger pipes, so to speak, if you want to think of that analogy, so that we can simply have more, you know, more, more bits and bytes moving through. That's bandwidth. All right. And remember that in the federal government, a little bit of an annoyance is that we've got to plan three years ahead in a budget cycle. And if somebody forgot to do that, it slows us down. Good news is we are finding money. We're using some year-end funding with the help of our CFO to beef up bandwidth capability as quickly as we can. Great. We'll, we'll take it when you get it. Okay. Um, we have a number of questions related to the um, shared services, uh, yes. and just to sort of wrap a lot of them into one kind of larger question, um, people are really wondering uh, if it's going to, the shared services consolidation, whether or not it will uh, eliminate current or future potential civil servant jobs to be replaced by contractor jobs, if there's a baseline uh, against which you can compare service now to the future under shared services um, and more people asking, you know, with the consideration of it, the impact to really those full-time employee right. okay, IT let's, staff. Okay, let's take those, let's kind of parse that apart. Um, the most important thing that I want you to hear, uh, and this is in my role not so much as CIO, but I am one of the executive sponsors of the Shared Service Initiative. The deputy secretary is kind of the chief among equals of the executive sponsors. Uh, Ellen Herbst, who is our assistant secretary for administration and our CFO, is the second, and I'm the third uh, as the CIO, but I'm an executive sponsor of the initiative. The DMC, I mentioned to you the Department Management Council, okay? Now I'm coming back to it. See, I anticipated we get this question, so I'm not, you know, I didn't misrepresent. The Department Management Council is the second highest governance body in the department, and it is comprised of the most senior career executives in the department. That's the steering body 
for the Shared Service Initiative. The DMC has already determined and made the decision, and listen to the wording very carefully, please, and if you have questions or something, I'll, I'll help explain. They have already determined that no one will lose federal employment as a result of the Shared Services Initiative. Meaning, if you are a career civil servant in the Department of Commerce, you will not lose federal employment as a result of shared services. All right, now, those of you who kind of see what's going on there, or, or you're reading between the lines a little bit, it does not guarantee that you will retain your exact same job and or position. What that means, translatable differently, those federal employees who are delivering services today that will in the future be delivered as shared services may see changes in their job or they may be asked perhaps to move to a different position and they may have an opportunity to reskill to move into newer opportunities, that type of thing, all right? Do, does that make sense? You see what I'm driving at? No one, the important message is, no one will lose federal employment as a result of the changes that aren't fully determined yet as a result of the Shared Services Initiative. All right, that's the first part of that question. The second part I already forgot, because I'm getting old. Um, so what's the, what was the second part? Uh, um, the impact to the full-time IT staffs that are housed at the bureau yeah, levels. Okay. And that, that really, that's an example of the IT gang is clearly going to be impacted in some not yet fully determined way. Mm -hmm. All right? So what I said applies to IT, it applies to HR folks delivering services today, finance folks at some point in time, and acquisition folks. Okay? There are some structural changes that are in the, formative in the formative stages, more will be forthcoming as those decisions are made and ratified by the Department Management Council. Okay? Okay. Um, let's do one more WebEx and then I'm sure there are people in the room with questions. Right. Um, someone writes, I appreciate your mention of taxpayers numerous times during your presentation. Can you tell me what Commerce is doing to facilitate rapid turnaround of internal IT customer requests to save the taxpayer money? Overreach and bean counting continues to roadblock and obstruct reasonable processes and procedures. An example would be moving textual changes to Office Action MS Word templates into production. This should be simple, straightforward, and rapidly accomplished once the changes have been made, tested, and approved. I am told by RIT that the deployment to production has to count as a software release. How can this kind of malarkey be eliminated, allowing us to adopt a 21st century customer service model? Okay, that's, that's an excellent question. And by the way, I actually agree in principle with what's being expressed there. Um, I'll be the first to tell you, and uh, my gang knows in my own office, we are focused very much on improving processes, continuous improvement. That's something that I learned in the private sector before I ever went into government. But many of you may be familiar with Six Sigma or similar types of programs. Many of you may be certified uh, in Six Sigma. But continuous improvement is a concept that we have to get better at adopting in the federal government writ large. If you zero in on IT, which is totally fair, here's what I would say. First and foremost, we need people to speak up just like that. And I applaud whoever that came from. We need folks to speak up and to kind of say, hey, this is crazy. This is taking too long. It's a pain in the butt. It doesn't make sense. I don't understand why it's so complex. Because if people don't speak up, take me as an example. If I don't know that there's a problem, I can't do anything to fix it. So what I, again, I'm asking you now for a second time to help out. You, all the folks on the WebEx, speak up, number one. Now, here's the frustrating part of speaking up. When you speak up, it is absolutely fair to have an expectation that somebody like me, if you're speaking up to me, or, or some other manager or person who can do something about it, 
is actually going to do something about it. Right? I also believe that's a very reasonable expectation. Here's what we are doing. The second of the Secretary's directive is is part and parcel of what we're trying to do together. The shared services organization is a whole lot about fixing broken processes. We are not just, you've heard the expression, paving the cow path or automating what's already automated. We'll just upgrade it you know, from 17 uh, generations of technology to today. We're about business process reengineering. If you're not familiar with that phrase, it simply says, hey, before you automate anything, take a look at the process and make the process excellent. By the way, you have to use metrics to get the process excellence. You measure the process. The metrics are up to the people involved and the recipients of the, of the outcome of the process. It's not just the process people work in the process. You've got to have the customers on the other end. Why? Because customers, in my opinion, my professional opinion, and it served me extraordinarily well in my career, never gotten in trouble, and I've succeeded very, very well when you adopt this belief. The customer is the only person who can define value. If you are not the customer, you're welcome to have an opinion. And I would tell you, it doesn't count. You may think you know better than your customer. What's of value to them? Trust me, you don't. Your customer defines value. Therefore, they've got to be in the mix. If you're fixing a process and you believe you know what's broken, and you never talk to your customer, it's amazing how often you don't fix what your customer is actually complaining about. All right? The CIOs are working together, and there are teams under them, first looking at with subject matter experts. Subject matter experts, and we have focus groups in every case who are customers who represent the voice of the customer. All right? Together, we have all the right types of wisdom, experience, need, value definition, to fix processes first and then automate. That's the approach we're taking in shared services. It's also the approach that a number of our bureaus who are further ahead in this are also taking. I'll give you a great example, and I am endorsing them. The International Trade Administration has done some marvelous work in a whole lot of the stuff that they do with their employees in countries around the world. They provided them with portals, they provided them with new tools and everything, and they've done it in concert with their customers. They've re-engineered processes, they've automated new capability, they've moved quality with speed, and they're doing really neat stuff. They've moved into the cloud for an awful lot of what they're doing. They're doing some really neat work. Business USA has done some marvelous stuff for their customers. But a whole lot of what they've done was talking and listening to their customers constantly so that they have a feel and they know what their customers are looking for. And they've turned around, used that information, and then enhanced the Business USA portal. Terrific stuff. Okay? And they got awards for it. Right? So those are some examples that are real, but the individual who brought that up, did exactly the right thing. Speak up, bring it to the attention of folks who then can engage to fix processes, cut down cycle time, cut through bureaucratic red tape, and a lot of the stuff, honestly, even I have to admit, I don't even know why we're doing it, some of the ways we're doing it in the first place. I get frustrated. Um, just quickly, I think I did a, a poor job of asking the first question. Someone just had a follow-up with, Please. they wanted a specific answer, and then we'll take a question from the room. Right. Um, so are contractors going to be hired instead of civil servants with the shared services? Oh, um, while that has not fully been determined, I think the answer is, in some cases, yes, there may be more contractors involved, and in some cases, no, there may not necessarily be an increase in the number of contractors. 
And here's why the answer goes both ways. The shared services organization essentially manages the delivery of a shared service. The shared services organization, in response to their customers, can actually first determine what are the service levels, metrics, measures, that are going to be used to ensure that the customer is satisfied with the service delivery. Now, depending upon what those metrics turn out to be and what service level agreements put in place, it's the shared services organization and the voice of the customer, focus groups to help them, that will determine which of the services and to what extent they will then be provided by contractor teams or contractor resources. Okay. So in general, I would say, based on my experience with similar shared services before coming to the department, most of the services are very likely to, to be delivered by contractor teams, okay? The extent to which that changes the ratio of contractors and employees is yet to be determined. Okay, thanks okay? for clarifying. And then in the back? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm Andrew Skull, I'm in the International Trade Administration, and um, I'm in the 21st century yes. pilot space. So. Um, we welcome a lot of the innovations there, the wireless, they've been very nice features. There's a couple of things though I'm wondering if you could speak to. It feels like technology was an afterthought in the 21st century space and it wasn't fully integrated into the design and there's three areas where there's been some ongo ongoing frustration with everyone with IT related. You know, the big emphasis is on mobility, yet we still can't forward our phones. So we can go away from our desk and work, but we can't get our phone calls. Right. The second one is the, the print centers. Follow Me Print is great, but the printer capacities are still very, very low, and they don't allow us to do this, some of the print jobs that we need to do. Um, and so we were never asked, what, did we, what do we need for printer capacity? Um, so that remains a problem. And the third one is the online room reservation system. It's a great system, but we're limited to who we can actually have um, accounts to okay. actually get those online room reservations, which isn't the way. None of us have assistants and secretaries anymore who do our calendars. We all have to do it ourselves. Okay, first of all, thank you for pointing those out. We actually can do something about all three of those. Um, very quickly and very simply. Um, I know this will sound funny, but it really will help me follow up. If you'd be kind enough to just summarize the three and send it to me, really an email, I, that will help. Because, here's the good news. Um, we know, I'm going to take the middle one first. We, we kind of, when we went out, because of the timing and the way that we acquired managed print services, we had some constraints because we went through GSA, basically took advantage of a program that allowed GSA to front the money, and we then are paying it back and amortizing it over time. We had a little bit of a constraint in the devices that we could get to quickly to meet the construction schedule and move in. We know, and the, and the finance team in particular has been very vocal about, hey, you got these rink and ink little things, we're trying to publish the budget, and the damn things print about two pages a year, and we need faster speed, that type of thing. All right, so the good news is we already have some things underway that in fact will begin to bring in heavier duty, um, faster devices. What we can do and what we are doing is we'll work with ITA to simply identify what do you need and we ought to be able to replace those relatively quickly. Now relatively quickly, will, because of what we're doing and things like that, will likely be during this fiscal year. So it may not be Monday, but we'll be able to move pretty quick. Okay, likewise, the, the, the call forwarding on the phones, I, I have to admit, that's a feature that's on my phone, I'm in the same space. Let me check on that one, all right? That should not be a big deal at all. That's a local decision, though. That's not an IT decision. So there's no IT constraint. Pardon me? They are, but what I'm saying is we don't make the decision on call forwarding. What's set up were, were basically guidance that came back from all the business offices to say, hey, we want the phones, we want these phones going that way, we want those phones going that way, that kind of thing. 
So that one, I think, is very easily fixed. And I don't mean months. I mean, that could be literally a week or two. We just need the update on where you want the stuff forwarded. And we should be able to execute that pretty quickly. All right. So again, if you send me that, we'll get the right people back to whatever business office in ITA we need to talk to. And the third one, um, what was the third one? Yeah, room res OK. The room reservation system was a little bit different. We, OCIO, and the CIOs did not make the room reservation selection. That came through GSA. We're a tenant in this building. The way that the renovation is being done, there are design architects, there's a consulting architect that Commerce uses. But some things GSA uses as part of this open office environment or something, and I'm not pointing the finger at GSA. There's nobody, nobody was trying to do anything wrong. So that selection came as part of the work done by GSA's design architects, and we implemented it. As to who has access and everything, again, that's like the phone forwarding. So if you just kind of identify whichever office, we ought to be able to get the right folks. But my understanding, and at least I know the way that my office is using it, that's a local office decision on who has access to that reservation system. Well, I, 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 okay, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm, I'm simply saying, if you'll send me this, I'll get with the ITA folks and just, you know, I admit, maybe ITA is handling this differently than NOAA and Office of the Secretary. Don't know. Well, you're, okay, I know you guys are shaking your head, so uh, I'll respectfully accept what you're telling me and I'll follow up on it. If you'll let me know, I'll follow up on it. One more in the room. Yeah. Uh, you know me, Chris Heflin. Yeah. I think part of what's coming here is, is kind of a root cause of something that sucks up a lot of time around here. You don't know who to call about what. And there's often a couple of units that may be in play to get something done. Uh, we have a fella on detail with us who's a godsend because he's like a concierge. He knows he knows where the buttons are. <laughs> we feel like we got roller skates. But we need some kind of knowledge net or some place where right, we can well, go on. Let, and let me, find let me out. help on this one, all right? Because actually, there is a process that should be your default process, regardless of the bureau you're in. Every single bureau has an established help desk and phone contact, that type of thing. You go there first. If you're not doing that, then I'm strongly recommending you go to. ITA's help desk, okay? It exists. I know it exists. Now, if you're, n n for anything, in other words, if you call ITA service desk, if you call the Office of the Secretary help desk, and you happen to say, look, HR blah, blah, blah isn't working or something, every service desk in the bureaus, under the guidance of their respective CIO, we've all agreed the way that they operate is, even if it's not an IT thing, they will direct it. They'll take the information and they'll direct it to the appropriate help desk. We've got all this stuff logged, all right? Now, if it's not working, I'm good. I'm not a miracle worker, but, but you have my commitment. I'll help at least ITA understand there's an issue, all right? Because if you're an ITA employee, your first line of support is the ITA service desk, not OCIO. That fact my commitment be, is I'll help. That fact needs to be shared. I would never dream to call the IT help desk on anything but IT. You shouldn't be. Chris, you're not ITA. No, no, but I mean. You're the office of the secretary. So you call our help desk. I do, but I would never think to call any IT help desk with anything other than IT problem. But so you're our, telling colleague, us that. Our, co our colleague rattled off three problems that are IT related. IT is involved. So my guidance, call the IT service desk. If it's not working, if you'll send me a note, I promise. I don't want to keep sucking up time, all right, because I hear you, you have my commitment, I'll help you. I'll follow up offline to help solve the problems that you, that you brought to light, okay? But in fairness to everybody, can I, can I see if there are other questions in different areas? Is that fair? Okay. We want to do, why don't we do one more in the room and then I'll we got one do another here. from WebEx. All right, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's more of a uh, question, suggestion, and it relates to at least three points that you have made about laptops with video and uh, ID cards 
and also security and so on. So I'll read it because it's long. Okay, please. Log on to my PC is hard. I have to plug in ID card and then key in my jumbled code. I hardly can remember what. Distracted in my daily grind, I often forget my badge behind and, lock, and get locked out in the hall with unattended badge and all. I do suggest IT embrace ID such as one handsome face. It's always on one head and neck. Video stream is hard to hack. Face recognition being smart by FBI and MasterCard is used already. For IT, it would be proper cup of tea or mug of coffee if mug shot is the idea that's being sought. Okay, a lot of, a lot of good ideas in there. Um, may, I, may I ask a favor? Can I get with you offline? Yeah. All right, because I think there may be some things you're running into, a little bit like this previous question. Uh, more than happy to dedicate a little time. If you've got a specific situation or something, then I'd like to understand that because there are things that we are doing on behalf of everybody. But, like anything else, things don't always work exactly the way that they are supposed to work every day. What we're trying to do is identify things that don't work, fix them, and if there's a root cause to what's going on, identify that root cause so that we can apply it systemically across everything we're doing. It's more like a future because... Uh, yep, yep, I hear that, so and that's... Exactly, yeah. And we're moving, we're hopefully moving toward much of what you're saying, not all of it yet. Okay. Okay. I have um, a comment and a sort of request for your thoughts from, from someone within the ranks of IT. Right. Um, they mentioned that retaliation from division management is a very real thing, that there is a culture of no problem here and you know, as you're suggesting that people bring up issues that they want worked on and things that are wrong and problems that they see that they'd like addressed, when these things are brought up, that person or team is considered negative or not a team player and is otherwise marginalized. And they say there is a huge disconnect between division management and the branch's technical teams. And she'd like your okay, thoughts on that. Okay, first, first of all, um, I admit it kind of saddened me a little bit to learn that. Um, but uh, I certainly... You know, I'm certainly accountable in some way, shape, or form. The secretary certainly holds me accountable for IT across the entire department. I clearly don't have visibility into everything that's going on. But that's not an excuse, right? Once I become aware of a problem, as I talked about earlier, I can begin to kind of help address. So what I'd like to ask whoever sent that question forward, if, if you are comfortable and I will use it only with your permission, or not at all, just for my own information. If wherever that came from, if you could, if you could let me know, where do I need to look to help address what's being relayed? You have my commitment, I will then engage appropriately without disclosure with management in the affected areas to see if I might be able to help with what's going on. But here's the broader thing that I want everybody to understand, and those people who have worked with me in my career, and now those people who have worked with me in, in the Department of Commerce. Um, I, I am a huge believer in the voice of the individual. Right? And, and if you go back and look at my career record, I think what you will find is I am 100% opposed to any kind of retaliation not necessarily getting involved in all the whistleblower laws. I'm making it a little bit easier to, for this conversation. I respect any and all laws, rules, regulations, and I'm very, very proud in all of my career. I've never violated or been accused of violating any rule, regulation, executive order, Congress, this, that, or the other thing, particularly in the federal environment. But here's my belief as, as an executive, as a senior executive and now in federal government. Every one of us has an absolute right to bring forward to his or her management at whatever level they feel comfortable bringing that forward. When they see something that, that they believe can be improved, isn't working the way it should, or 
They simply believe there's a better way to be doing things. And I will always, always, until I retire for the third time, I will always support that. Right? So my commitment to that individual, if you feel comfortable reaching out and letting me know where do I need to look, who do I need to talk to, I'm more than willing to do that. Thank okay. you. That's great. I think that's much appreciated right. by people, and you've got a good WebEx response, and it's nice yeah. to know that you're available for that. Um, how are we? How are people's interest levels? More questions in the room? Please. Yes. It's uh, your last quote you just, uh, just said. Yes. Uh, I'm not talking about whistleblowing and leaking some information. No, no, that, just the, the two are Im separate. Yeah, improvement okay. part. Yeah. Uh, you see, the problem with uh, improving things is that I have personally, if I want to improve something, I have to go to my program. I'm the lowest one in, in the pod. Yeah. So I have to go to my program manager, to section chief, to brand chief, to a division chief, and so on and so forth. <coughs> so uh, with that, if I go to my program manager, a program manager doesn't like it, it's dead on arrival. So I suggest it was unconference about a year or something. Remember, unconference. Mm -hmm. and I'm going here. And I suggested that there are some kind of, I call it court of innovation, mm -hmm. like express elevator. Instead of going through hierarchy, I can go to my peers, collection of my peers, and voice it, not implement it willy-nilly, just voice it, express it. Yep. So it could be heard and that could be maybe somebody will hear it and pick it up. Maybe with participation of senior management. Yep. Otherwise, it's uh, going again through all this hierarchy at any step, it might be dead okay, on arrival. That's, that's fair. How many of you, are you aware and how many others are aware of our ideation application? That's what yeah, it's called. Yeah. It's basically an electronic suggestion box, right? It's on Commerce Connection, right? It's out there, use it. In other words, what that does is it bypasses the hierarchy. Anybody can put an idea on there. There's a committee, there's a team that takes a look at all those. We got several suggestions that were related to IT that came back to my office for action to kind of evaluate and say, hey, these are good ideas. A couple of them we're trying to move forward. Now sometimes you run into funding challenges and stuff. But that's a mechanism that really does allow ideas to be brought forward and they don't get cut off by management hierarchy. So that's one way. The other way that I will kind of offer, I'll offer you a couple ideas for everybody. Um, and, you, and you, have to, you have to take this in the context and the spirit in which it's offered, right? Because first and foremost, each of you works within some organization. And I don't think that your management is going to let you get away with something along the line of, well, Steve said I could do this, okay? If you're outside my organization, that's not quite what I'm advocating. But I'm sharing some ideas. First. There is absolutely strength in numbers. So if you believe you have a good idea, talk it up with colleagues. Talk it up with other people. And bring the idea forward as a group idea. Number, that's one idea, all right? Second, all of you in your careers, I'm positive, have built relationships over time with folks higher in the organization outside your chain of command. Use those people as a sounding board. Go to those people with your idea and ask them, hey, I brought this forward, it didn't go anywhere. Give me some ideas. What did I, what did I, what did I overlook? What did I maybe not do that I could do better? Oftentimes, and this is tough, and I'm not picking on you, and I'm not picking on anybody else, but sometimes when an idea is presented, and I'll use myself as an example, I'm trying to encourage my team to bring ideas for it. But I sometimes am tough on my team. Meaning, they'll bring an idea forward and I'll ask a bunch of questions. Now, some people may get discouraged. And what they hear is, well, Steve doesn't like this idea. He asked me a tons of questions and he shot it down. I didn't shoot it down. I ask questions that are predicated around 
if I'm going to put support behind this and move it forward, I know what my peers are going to ask me. Another way of saying what I'm saying, build the business case. Build the business case. And if you've got a solid business case, people will pay attention. So there are a couple ideas that I'd offer to you. And I got folks in my office, to keep me honest here, um, they, they do know and they are encouraged and they have total right to speak up. And if they think, yeah, Steve, come on, you don't really do that. You shoot everything down or something, they'll tell you. But I don't think that's really what's going on. Okay? So build the business case, network with people outside your chain of command, strengthen numbers. Okay? What else we got? One more thing. Yeah, please. Um, yes, sir. So you mentioned the Commerce Ideas tool on Commerce Connection. Right. And I remember seeing the email announcing that and went and looked and there were a lot of ideas and I had voted on a couple and then didn't hear anything for maybe six months, a year. I don't even remember how long. I didn't yeah. hear anything. But then just recently got a bunch of emails back saying, yeah. okay, we've looked at these and we're yeah. going to move on this one. We're not going to move on that one. And it kind of felt like applying for a federal job and then two years later finding out that you didn't get the job. You know, uh, surprise. Uh, well, yeah. no, look, you're right. And, and kind of, I, I will admit, I'll put myself inside the team that kind of took a long time and that type of thing. One, I apologize on our behalf. We should have moved faster. This was the first time we tried this. We got a little bit inundated with the volume that came back. It took longer than we thought in evaluating and kind of figuring out, hey, who do you even send this to? And stuff like that. So what's going on, first time through, we didn't get it right. Process wasn't quite fully excellent yet. We haven't given up. We're trying to refine, we're trying to get better. I think, believe it or not, even though it's been a delay, there really are some good ideas in there and we are now trying to move forward on some of what we consider the best of those ideas. So if you'll bear with us a little bit, I think some good things are gonna come out of this. Sorry, I can I ask a it really- took, It took too long. Just a really quick follow up on that. Please, just yeah. Commerce Connection as a whole. Could you just say a little bit about your, your vision for what you want it to be? Well, here's, here's what's interesting. Um, Commerce Connection is actually managed and developed by the Office of Digital Strategy out of public affairs. It's not in my office. So while I have different ideas and things like that, and we work very closely with Mike Kruger, who is the Director of Digital Strategies, and with Beniva Schulte, who heads the Office of Public Affairs, it's really, it, it's, it's their baby, so to speak, okay? Um, we lend technical support as that team needs it, because they don't have in-depth technical expertise. So it's their design, it's, it's, it's kind of their, their content and, and their vision that we then help enable with technology. I'm not trying to duck your answer, but I have to admit, I haven't been much involved personally in the vision for Commerce Connection. And that's not a value judgment. It's not, there's nothing negative. I'm just candidly answering, I kind of don't know what the vision is. Um, that's my fault, not theirs. Steve, we're yes, about out of time, and I want right. to just Excellent. let everyone know a few things. Um, we have a lot of questions on WebEx we didn't get to, and I'm sure there are a few more in the audience. Um, as Steve very generously said, scooper at doc.gov. Right. You can address some of those things that we didn't touch on. Um, additionally, this uh, presentation will be on YouTube within a few days. There, are, For the WebEx people, there were no slides. It was Steve speaking right. informally off the cuff. Uh, so you can probably within a week we'll get that posted so stay tuned for that um, and thank you it, it can be you. you know IT is not always the easiest thing to get up in front of a crowd about but you are brave and handled it beautifully lots of good advice about IT and across the board in general so thanks for being with us today my pleasure thanks for the invitation thank you all thank you